Okay. Hey, Tom. So, the purpose of this live is for me to break down the process that I use for making chamfer cuts, all the facets at the end, and uh, the hook knife cuts, and try and do all, basically all the sort of finishing. So here we have a scoop, <clears throat> and you can see it's basically symmetrical. There might be a few things that I'll tweak as we go along, but it is, um, yeah, the, the lines of the rim here, are the way I want them. It's set up the way I want it. And at this stage, I basically get everything about how I want it. And it's at this stage that I do the handle facets and then I move on to the, excuse me, to the bowl. And one last thing I'm gonna do is just pull this rim up a little bit tighter so that it's an even consistency all the way around. But I'm not gonna focus too much, particularly on scoops, um, something like a scoop, but also with something like an eater. I'm not going to focus too much on getting the outside of the bowl nice at this stage because I'm going to do the inside first, get that exactly how I want it, and then let the outside react to the inside. Um, and it's nice to leave a little extra on the outside as an insurance policy against something going wrong. So if anyone has any questions pertaining to what I am doing, it's totally great to shout it out. Um, I want this to be as educational as possible for everybody. So I tend to always do the facets on the back of the handle first. And I'm gonna lower this so you don't necessarily see my face. I want you to see my hands more than my face. Um, let's see here. All right, good, that's what I want. Turns out that wearing this white apron not only keeps wood chips out of my pocket, but it also improves the white balance of the video and makes it, uh, makes the wood less washed out which is just a nice little detail. So, um, all right, so I always do facets on the back of the handle first. Um, and you can do facets like this where you're going like that, but I find it's, I get more control if I start the facet like this and then brace my hand against my body and actually pull the spoon out like that. It's a little trickier with short handled things like this coffee scoop, but, um, just generally get a better line. And if you get a little bit of choppiness at first, take a second cut, see if it'll smooth up with that second cut. And um, in general, scoops are one thing where I actually have kept the facets fairly crisp because I feel like it's really helpful in an object like a scoop handle that you're gonna pinch to have there be um, to have there be sort of flat, even planes where a beard that gets in the way. Does your beard help with the white balance, Dan? All right, so that's all I'm gonna do on the back, but if I was doing any of my other forms, I would then take each of these facets and roll it into a, a separate, you know, put additional facets on either side on, on basically taking down the high points. Now I'm doing facets down the handle here, and this is where you need to anticipate how much material to leave because if you don't leave enough material to have the handle you want once you've gotten these final facets off, um, then you're in trouble. So you have to make sure that you start with a thick enough handle that you can get the three-dimensionality that you want. The side that is hard to see, you see how this side is easy for me to see what I'm looking down on? The other side you have to be careful not to overcut it. You need to anticipate, because it's down here, you can't actually see it when I'm making the cut. I need to anticipate how deep to go, because otherwise you're gonna burn right through that and blitz past into the other facet, and then it's gonna change the way it looks from this angle. So, now that I have the two angles, you can see that the center facet got a little messed up, which is fine, because I deliberately left myself some room. But my two facets on either side are essentially done, and then I can just redo the center one to get everything nice and clean and even. You see how that's much easier than trying to get everything perfect, is have a process where you can clean things up at the appropriate moment. So, there we go. Nice even facets. Um, you know, on 
the one time that I don't use um, this long four inch knife has been when making a a bubble scoop because it's so small that there's really no advantage to having the extra length. And I would say here as well, like there's there's really no advantage on something this small of having a knife this big. That being said, I do think it's always worth using at least a Moro 106 because um, that amount of length is applicable. So now you can see I'm, I'm knocking off the sharp corners here. And one thing that I find useful when thinking about doing these sorts of micro chamfers is to um, basically like let the let the weight of the knife be what takes off the the edge like don't have it be that you're trying to make a cut just have it be that um, that whatever the weight of the knife is is gonna dictate the the thickness of the cut that you take because um, that's the amount of pressure that you're going to be applying is the weight of the knife. And the nice thing about that is that that's much easier to maintain because um, all it requires is you to sort of back off and let the way of the knife do the work. Whereas if you are trying to dictate how deep you make those micro chamfer cuts, you're gonna, it's going to vary and then the thickness of your cut is going to vary. So you get a more even result if you just let the weight of the knife blade itself do the work and decide how deep to go. Um, notice that I'm making these cuts along the top of the handle going sideways across the handle rather than going up, 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 up. If you do up, 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 that has a different effect. It makes a sort of um, faceted diamond thing. But by going sideways, I create a surface that's rounded this way and rounded this way. And then when I burnish it, it actually compresses further and becomes as, almost as though I sanded it, which I really like that effect and I tend to do it on all my spoons. Now, I'm looking down here into the neck of these little um, divots. Depending on the state of your knife and the moisture content of your wood and how well the piece of the spoon is oriented within the piece of wood, like how well the handle is lined up, you may have one or both sides that are difficult to clean up. And at a certain point, you just need to walk away from imperfection because that amount of chatter is not going to affect someone's ability to use and enjoy this scoop. But if I ruin it to the point where you can tell from this angle that something's going on, well, then I really, I've, I've, you know, I've sort of shot myself in the foot a bit. Um, okay, now I can see that my scoop is just a tad wide when it comes to being truly round. So I'm just going to trim it up just a touch. I'm not don't have to get it absolutely perfect because it's really hard to see when something is perfectly round just from the outside with all this stuff going on, on the inside um, and we're gonna move on to the hook knife um, okay always sheath your tools yeah Trevor it, sh it should be um, alright so uh, I'm going to use the other one so that I can demonstrate the other cuts. Okay, so most of Matt's hook knives come with this long handle and a lot of other hook knives come with long handles. And the idea is that you can hold it back here and have your fingers in here. And I think that makes sense to a lot of people. Uh, I have two, two pieces of beef with this type of thing. Um, and I described these in videos on IGTV the other day. One is that this motion is really hard on me. I, I suffer from sort of borderline tendonitis from an old injury um, and just how much uh, I use this hand at all times of the year. So anything I can do to not essentially be doing this is valuable. Um, the other thing is that I just find that there's not nearly as much power um, doing it this way as the way I do it. Now, with some of the big Tuka cams, I think there can be a lot of power in the pivot, right? In the in the like using it essentially to to pivot around. I think that makes more sense to me, although I've never done it. Um, this where you're doing this with your hand, I think is just I don't know. I think I think you're just asking for for it. So I always choke up on my knives. I put my forefinger right here on the spine, and then close the rest of my hand and you can see how I actually can't hit my thumb even if I try. Um, whereas if it was up here, 
I could hit my thumb, you see that? Um, so lowering it down moves it further this way in your hand, and that's really important. It also gives you more power than if you're up here. You have less power here than I do here by a lot, by more than you would think. So you can see my spoon has all this material in the middle because when I was cutting my rim, I was essentially cutting it at an angle and ignoring all this stuff. If I started at the edge, not only would it sort of be, it would just be difficult because I'd be working my way in towards this big mound of material and um, trying to get the knife to go into something. It's just hard. It's just harder to do that. And then I sort of still have this big mound of material in the middle. So I find it much easier to start directly in the middle of the spoon bowl and immediately start diving down in. Now for a round shape like this, rather than sort of go the length of the bowl, I will often just immediately flip it around and basically create a round hole. And then from there, it's just, it's kind of just swirling around, it's swirling around, swirling around, swirling around. Because what the hook knife is good at is going downhill in the grain. And the reason it works okay to go across a spoon bowl is because when you start on one side and go across, you are going down into the depths of the bowl and then um, the reason you can come up the other side often is that, uh, is that grain is not just one way. There's grain that goes this way. There's also grain that goes this way, right? And so when you're coming down into the bowl from one side, you're going down into the grain that is this way. When you're coming up the other side and it's still willing to cut, it's because you're going down in the grain that's going this way. So because grain is um, three-dimensional, it's not just sheets on a single plane, it's a grid, it's a matrix of fibers of cells connected to cells connected to cells. Um, there's more than one way to be going downhill in the grain. And that's why a hook knife is always willing to go across the grain because you're going downhill and then you're going uphill. Now it's harder to go uphill largely because of the mechanics that at this point you're getting so close to your hand that it's like, hard to get that power. You don't have as much power. So not only that, uh, if you try and exit up and over your thumb, at some point you're going to gouge a big piece out of your thumb. So I always recommend that people go down into the middle and then either get it to sort of pop free like it's doing for me um, or just let it be stuck and then come at it from the other side and go down into the middle from there. Um, either way, it's useful to think of it as like a... Um, when you're digging a hole with a shovel where you're going to grab from the edge and go down in. Now, one thing that I see people try and they, they struggle with all the time in my lessons is they try to go from the middle down to the tip. The problem is that all the grain is flowing that way from the tip down into the middle. So now you're trying essentially to cut exactly opposite. Um, against that grain and it does that thing where it gets choppy and it stops on them. And um, I'm going to move this over here so you can see what I'm doing better. Uh, and so um, when they realize that, when they realize that they either need to be going across the grain or coming swirling around the rim of the, the bowl, uh, that's when their cuts start to get more fluid. It's also those first couple cuts are just harder. And once you get a hole started, um, it just is easy to swirl around and around and around, no matter what the, the shape is. Now, one of the things you'll see me do is I'm, uh, it took me a while to realize I was even doing this, but I move both my hands. Um, so I get power from my hook hand coming down in, but also notice that this hand is not holding still either. I get a lot of power by pushing this up against the hook. So some of the power is coming from my hook hand, some of the power is coming from my other hand, and I end up with twice the power I would otherwise get, which means that I can get through material quickly, and my hand is not as fatigued as if I was doing it any other way. You can see how quickly I'm blitzing down through this bowl here. Now, the way I tend to do it is I try and go out and down at the same time. I want to hit close to my target depth and close to my target rim at about the same time because you want to maintain equal amounts of delicacy in all the parts of the spoon 
um, so that you don't because when a, when you're when the spoon is at a rougher stage you're applying more force right I'm applying a lot of force in these initial cuts when the whole thing is rough and strong that amount of force gets radiated through the spoon um, and sometimes you're applying oppositional force by actually squeezing the spoon and I have back when I before I realized that I needed to bring everything into delicacy at the same time I've actually crushed spoon bowls in my hand because you don't realize how much force you're you're exerting just to provide oppositional support um, so again uh, there's a couple different types of uh, ways of thinking of the cut there's what I call the tip pivot where you essentially have the the tip down in the spoon and it doesn't have to be in something this deep and you are and your thumb is braced and you're pivoting and you're it may look like you're it may look like you're using the front half of the blade but don't get it wrong you are you are pivoting on the tip of the you're pivoting on the tip of the the knife um and so that's one and then there's another one that I think of as the uh, well, I don't know. I actually, don't actually call them anything. I'm making them up as I go along. Uh, the handle pivot, where, for instance, um, I'm going to essentially pivot on the handle and then have the tip of the knife go that way. You see how that's fundamentally different from the tip pivot? It's particularly useful in these instances of cleaning up these shoulders here and here. Um, and then I'll go back to a tip pivot here. Um, I do very little of sort of just one thing and just another. It's it's a very fluid mix of of pivoting on the tip, pivoting on the the handle, hand squeeze combined with uh, the hand motion of the the other one, and um, and honestly, the I wouldn't think of it in terms of like. Um, you know, I'm going to do this cut and then I'm going to do this cut. I would think of it in terms of like, how can I reach this little bit of wood here that I'm having a hard time reaching? Well, maybe if I hold the knife back like this, well, and then you have to think to yourself, what's well, going to happen if the knife slips and pops free. So you need to make sure you're doing it in a safe way. Um, for me, doing it in a safe way means always be choked up on the knife and always make sure that my other hands, parts of my hand are not in the way, right? So if this slips and comes up, I don't have this part of my hand right here and it can plow right into the pad of my thumb or the base of my thumb. So at this point, I am getting close to my finished rim. And I should say, going back to the tip pivot and the handle pivot, one of the things that is really valuable about uh, a hook knife that has a consistent curvature is that it makes the same cut because sometimes when I'm doing a tip pivot I really am using the back part of the blade like particularly when I'm back here um, you know I'm using the the back the sort of the well really I'm using the middle portion I rarely use the back part of the blade but it's usually like I'm either using this part or I'm using this part this part or this part let's call this tip of the blade and the back part of the blade even though it's not really right at the handle if those are a consistent curve then they will produce a consistent curve no matter which one you do the my big beef with compound hook knives that have different curves is that you need to be able to do different cuts at different moments um, to reach different parts of the spoon bowl and if if depending on which cut you're doing it's producing a different curve that's like another variable you have to keep in your mind and like sometimes that makes it hard to get a nice smooth surface on the inside of your spoon it may allow you to reach into a deeper spoon bowl than a knife that's really shallow but one of the things i think that this hook knife which is matt's monagnock gets right is that the consistent curve and the quality of the curve and the way it tips over the handle means that you can do most shapes most deep shapes um, with this knife um, and 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 at the same time it's giving you a consistent curve here from here um, and so it just means that without having to recalibrate sort of what curve that part of the knife is cutting versus this part of the knife it just makes it easier to subconsciously create 
nice consistent curves within the bowl. So now I am, now I've got the rim roughly figured out. You can see it's not exact all the way around. But at this stage, this is my chance to sweeten up the rim one last time. And it's worth taking the time to do this because this is the last moment I'm going to get to be able to adjust things like this little bump in here. So it's worth doing it now before I get the rim too fussy um, because it's going to have the effect of widening up the rim. So I'm going to recut this line. And notice how I'm pivoting on this finger here. So that allows me to pivot all the way around and get a really nice, clean looking line. And then I pivot on my thumb for this one. And again, this is about creating a nice, clean rim can see how clean yeah you can see how clean I'm able to get that rim this last little bit of the rim here I'm going to first come down the handle see how far that takes me and then ghost up to it from either side because um, this is where the grain changes and you want to be careful not to dig yourself into a hole here and if I can get it by just coming down the handle and have it end up clean that's great that's all I want I'll look at it from this angle. You see how oh, interesting. So I've got a real twist in my spoon bowl between my spoon bowl and my handle, but I can undo the twist by lowering this side, particularly this part of the rim. And I have the thickness of this rim within which to do that. And I think I'll be able to get it close enough for my taste. Oh yeah, huge difference, huge difference. That's good. That's good, that's good. We're gonna do just a little bit more. So you can see how pausing at this point to get the rim exactly right before you mess around, you just see stuff. As, this, as the spoon gets more and more delicate, you're gonna see stuff and a couple degrees here or there, that you weren't able to visualize back when the spoon was sort of blockier and rougher, as it gets more finished, you're gonna be able to visualize exactly what needs to happen to really keep it in alignment and see how it's just slightly out of alignment. And, um, and so it's worth doing that. Now, at a certain point, um, you sort of reach the limits of how much you can pull something into alignment. And here we have spoon bowl that is as close as I can get it to being in alignment and I'm just not gonna sweat about getting it more than that you can see there's still a bit of a twist but really not bad um, so at this stage and you can see how that totally widened up the rim so that's why you do it at this stage is that it allows you to uh, get it right from this angle, right, and um, and then not have that eat up your time trying to get it perfect before you get this part right. Spoon carving is about sort of getting the order of operations right. Once you get the order of operations right, and, and by right, I just mean like it makes sense to do this before that for the reasons I just said. Once you get the order of operations right, what you do is just kind of more straightforward. Um, all right, so now I'm going to continue with the bowl and, um, again, shout out if you have any questions, guys, I'm going to continue in the bowl. And what I'm going to do is as I go deeper and I have plenty of thickness here, there's going to be a point at which I can't go deeper because I'm starting to max out the curvature of the knife versus the radius of the spoon. There's a certain depth that I can go given this width, um, and given this curvature, um, and if it's not that really what it is, is how deep can I go before this tip is no longer lifted up off the wood? You see how the tip is just slightly lifted up off the wood at a certain point. It's not going to be, it's going to be right. The tip is going to be right up against the wood. And that's the deepest that I can go. And I'll know that I'm there because I'm going to, I will start to get chatter marks here, excuse me, here and here that I can't clean up. So 
I want to approach this final depth um, with some precision, meaning I want to get close to it, feel when I'm at it, and then be able to sort of do all my finishing cleanup cuts very quickly. Because what I can do when I start to get those real chatter marks that tell me I'm close is if I've left myself a little bit of thickness in the rim, then I can widen up the rim and that gives me just enough wiggle room because I've now increased the width even though I haven't changed the curvature of my knife. Um, it gives me just enough wiggle room to then sort of do some final sweet cuts and get out of there. Um, but I need to approach it in as organized a fashion as possible so that that's all that I have to do. If, if I hit that depth and I've been really sloppy and I haven't kept everything clean and symmetrical and nicely curved, then, um, then it's too much work that needs to get done and usually widening the rim isn't going to give me enough wiggle room. So I have to sort of I have to sort of try and get everything rounded and curved so that as I go down, I'm going down in a nice even pattern. And you can hear that little that little chatter mark right there is telling me that I'm getting fairly close. So I'm going to work to make this inner rim nicely curved so that I know what line to follow when I widen it out, right? I don't want any surprises at that stage. So let's get that rim cleaned up. Now it's worth noting that this is a special set of operations that I do for these sorts of round shapes that I know are gonna max out my depth. So really that's the, the coffee scoop, the bubble scoop, and the long scoop are that. For my other spoons, um, you don't have this same sort of like maxing out the capacity of the knife issue. And it's more about, at this stage, getting the rim exactly the way you want it. And then, um, and then blending in the curvature on the bottom. But these round forms are really kind of a special case. Now, the cool thing about them is because I'm pushing each one to the max that, uh, that I can achieve with that particular hook knife, it means that I'm getting probably as close as I ever get to a flawless curved finish on the inside because the finish becomes a reflection of the curvature of the knife, right? I'm pushing it right up until the two reflect one another almost exactly, and then I'm trying to be done. Um, so you end up with a really clean finish on the inside of the bowl that you don't have quite as clean on shallower forms. Um, on the other hand, the shallower forms are more forgiving because you aren't essentially maxing out the knife. So you can see how there's, I'm not sure you'll be able to see it. Um, yeah, you can't really see it. There's a couple chatter marks starting to happen here at the tip of the bowl. And so that is telling me that I'm awfully close, but I wanna make sure I've pushed everything to a consistent depth before I go and widen that rim. Um, and I'm also, you know, if I can eyeball a consistent width here, which I pretty much can at this point, and then I use the knife as a datum to create a consistent um, sort of hollow space within that width, um, it's an easy way for me to create a scoop that is that are remarkably consistent one to the other in terms of their volume. Um, without really measuring anything because I'm using the hook knife to tell me when I've gone deep enough for this given width, which I've eyeballed to be roughly the same. Um, all right, so now, and you can see what happens is my ability to clean up this shoulder starts, I'm, see how I'm right on the tip of the knife there. So that's as deep as I can go and still clean up the shoulder from this direction. Now, could I use um, a hook knife of the opposite hand? So I'm a lefty, even though you're seeing me as a righty. Could I? So could I use a righty hook to clean up those places? Sure, but I don't because instead I'm using the hook knife to tell me when to stop. So, 
Okay, so now I have uh, essentially widened the rim out just a smidge, also trying to use this opportunity to make it as round as possible. And by widening the rim out just a smidge, that should give me the wiggle room I need to now go down one more layer of cuts and really get everything cleaned up. So, going down. And if I can go, particularly in this spot here where I've got um, uh, chatter marks here, if I can go down, straight down from the rim, sometimes I can get away with out any chatter marks when it would have done chatter marks had I been swirling around the rim like that. So to some extent now I'm going down in, down in. Okay, good. And what I'm shooting for at this stage is an even curvature. I've learned that you don't feel individual tool marks as much as you feel bumps from where the curvature isn't quite right. So what I'm shooting for is not so much getting a perfectly even finish as I am paying attention to where there are bumps. Sometimes those bumps are ridges between the tool marks, but often there's, if you focus on the ridges between the tool marks, you're missing the forest for, for the trees. Thanks, Wida. Um, and it's more useful to focus on where is there sort of a larger scale bump um, or hump in the material that needs to be pushed down. Um, so for instance, right here, there's some tool marks, but there's also a little bump right here that I can feel with my thumb. So I'm using my fingers to we feel where those are and to some extent I'm coming down in from the rim consistently back here I will I will um, do a little more swirling around the grain a little bit good good and I need to and at a certain point you need to decide that you're done. How do you decide that you're done? Largely, it's knowing yourself. It's knowing what your tendencies are and having a clear idea of what it is you actually want to achieve and knowing where you yourself are going to trip yourself up from achieving that. So if I know that I have a tendency to want to go back and do a little more and a little more, then I, if I am aware of that tendency, then I can often tell myself in the moment, you know what, this is good enough. Um, good enough. Okay, so feeling for the curvature, everything looks and feels good. And a few last little scrapes, good. All right, now my rim is the way I want it from this angle. Yeah, my rim is the way I want it from this angle. Uh, it's the correct thickness, although it could probably use a little trim up on the outside, and my inside is the way I want it. Now I'm going to use the hook knife. Excuse me, I have an itch in my back. Ah, I can't reach it. It's the wrong spot. Ah, it's the worst. There we go. Okay. Whew. Um, so now I'm going to use the hook knife to do a micro chamfer right around this inside rim. Just knock off that little corner that's right on the edge. Micro chamfers on the rim need to go from here to here and here to here and then from the tip to here and here. So think of it in the same way that you, um, let's see, think of it as the opposite of how you carve around the outside of the spoon bowl. So it goes from the tip to the widest part and the handle to the widest part. So like this. And the nice thing about the hook knife rather than using the sloy is that the hook knife's already bent to get up out of the way. So it's not going to get in its own way. So, and again, I'm basically just letting the weight of the knife do the cutting and think of it more as scraping than actually cutting a line. You can see, you can see how thin it is. Let's see if we can get it to focus. Right? It's very thin. It's very small. 
um, I'm not actually applying any force to the knife as I cut this. I'm just letting the weight of the knife do its thing. <sighs> okay, good. Now, um, now I'm going to trim the outside of the bowl. And I'm just looking at the pommel of this handle and realizing that I need to adjust one little thing so that it looks even. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so now this is my chance to touch up the outside. The curved knife, the hook knife, does a good job of creating a nice sweet curve on the inside. And a lot of times it shows up where the outside is a little bit choppy. The trick is to not try to recut the entire thing because then it will still be choppy. Um, but in this case, I'm going to recut the tip a little bit. And then in the other places that don't need quite as much removed, I'm just gonna try and knock off the bumps. And you won't get it totally perfect, but knocking off the bumps will go a long way towards making it look a lot smoother. This is the only time you'll ever see me use the potato peeler cut is in this situation because it, it is useful to see exactly what you're doing. So you will see me here. You see how I'm just trying to knock off the bumps and then places where it's a little thick, I'll do slightly more sustained cut. This little adjustment goes a long way toward making the spoon bowl look nice and even. Or rather the rim look nice and even. Okay, good. So that's that. Now I'm going to do the um, micro chamfer around the top of the rim here. Now the trick is, Remember, the grain is flowing this way down the handle like this. Thanks, Tom. It's flowing this way down the, down the spoon bowl and the rim. So if my knife is at too shallow of an angle, I'm actually cutting uphill in the grain and it's going to chip. And it's such a delicate piece of wood at this point that you, it's going to chip easily. So the way to get around it is it's uphill in the grain this way, right? But this way, it's downhill in the grain. So tilt your knife so that it's at more of an angle like this, and then you can go from that widest part around to the rim very delicately. Again, just let the weight of the knife determine how much gets taken off. And you wanna do it at this stage because you still have, um, you still have uh, quite a thick rim on the outside, and so, um, so you don't have to worry about going too far onto the rim here because that still needs to be defined. So here we go again from the widest part to here. Now I decided a while ago that I'm not going to try and put a little chamfer on these notches here because that was always where I messed up and it's always so late in the game that you mess up that and you're like, oh God, it's the worst. And quite frankly, it just doesn't matter. Like no one's fingers are gonna go there and be like, ooh, it's not quite perfect. Um, you know, it just it just doesn't matter. And it was it was something that was consistently tripping me up. Now, here we come to the trickiest part of the spoon uh, of the of a scoop carve, which is how do you get the outside to be the right thickness? Um, I have learned that I can push it to be quite delicate and that I should push it to be quite delicate uh, because um, otherwise it just feels really chunky, too chunky. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, you want to get sort of the thickness in the right areas. What I've found, you can do two things. You can choose to have it be thinner in the middle and have a thicker rim, um, which is okay. Uh, 
but it isn't quite as strong and it doesn't feel as delicate as if you let it be a little thicker in the middle and have it taper out to a thin rim all the way around. So how do you do that? The way I believe is to start in the middle and I just do a series of cuts from the middle to one side use my fingers as calipers to get a rough sense of the taper that I'm creating. Right? And I can feel that there's a little bump here and there's more thickness here than there is there. So I'm gonna deal with a little bump. Good. We're gonna go over here and deal with that thickness. The nice thing about this is that you're reacting to the inside. So let's say you did an imperfect job hollowing on the inside and this curvature was actually different than this curvature. Well, you'd still be able to feel the relative thickness and you would be less in danger of blitzing through on the side that maybe pushed in deeper because you're feeling for that thickness, not anything else. So now, right now I've got that sort of center bit done and now I can uh, essentially work my way forward and do the same thing. This is a slow process, guys. This takes a while to get a the outside of a scoop bowl to what it could be. And I used to not do it because I felt like, ugh, you know, I could save that 10 minutes by just letting it be a little chunkier. Well, guess what? It just feels so much better when you get the thickness right. All right, so now I did the next layer. Now I'm gonna do the tip. The tip is the hardest part because it's all that end grain. And you also need to be careful not to crush it by squeezing the whole thing too much. So um, it's a lot of, notice how I'm not holding it here and here, I'm holding it here and here. And that way when I squeeze, I'm squeezing it together, not squeezing it like this. Um, so, like that. And again, uh, you also, as it gets more delicate, you're in danger of actually ripping the fibers apart. If you are cutting across a bunch of fibers, you wanna be cutting with fibers. So in this case, that means cutting in this direction because of the way the fibers flow through the bowl like this. Um, so it's easier to cut across end grain as long as you're also going with the fibers in one of the, you know, in one of the directions that you can go with them. Um, and the more you cut across fibers completely, the more danger, the more at risk you're putting the, the delicacy of the bowl. This is true of all forms, not just scoops, when you get to the point where you're carving the outside of the bowl. Um, but it's particularly true in this case because the inside of the bowl is hollowed and I'm creating a pretty delicate wall here. So, here we go, work my way towards the bowl tip. Good. Now, again, this is probably 90% of the way done, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna do the back of the bowl here because you can see how much more material there is there. And then I'm gonna go back over everything and knock these facets back one more time because I don't wanna make this so delicate that I can't fold it like this and make the cuts that I need to make without straining the spoon. So here I go on the back. Notice I didn't start in the middle. Um, that's because it's just there's like not much to hold on to and so you kind of tend to approach the middle from either side um, and notice that I'm using the tip of the knife to do all of this right when you use the back of the knife for this bit um, the problem with using the back of the knife is that it hides for for a much greater width the material underneath it as it's passing over and you can't adjust the knife as readily as when you use the tip, the material that you just, the cut surface emerges from behind the tip much faster than in the back of the knife. It doesn't, I mean like empirically, it's not that much faster, but it, that little extra sooner bit because it's thinner that it emerges from behind the knife gives you that time to react and adjust your cut to what's happening. Um, right, so I can see like, oh, I need to dig in a little bit deeper because I'm not cutting as deeply as I should be. Partly I'm, I'm knowing that by feel, but partly it's because the material is emerging from behind the tip of that knife, the very narrow tip, and it's allowing me to 
get that feedback loop in time to make meaningful changes in real time. Okay, notice how these cuts have smoothed out now because I've created lots of little facets and at a certain point, everything can kind of smooth out. I wanna be careful as I approach the handle here not to change what I wanted for the handle. So I'm gonna taper down in to essentially keep the handle the way I wanted to have it be. Just the flow of the facets from the back of the bowl to the handle without having to mess with it too much. Good. These back shoulders are a pain in the neck to do. And there's a tendency that everybody has to leave them too thick. Um, I've had spoons from all the top makers and most people leave these back shoulders thicker than they need to be. And I'm convinced it's because it's just a pain in the neck. But it's worth spending the time. Oops, sorry guys. It's worth my tip. That's right. Um, it's worth spending the time to do this right because the feel of something that has just the right amount of material back here versus something that's too chunky, I, I can't, until you feel it, you can't know sort of how delightful it feels to have something that has just the right amount of material and no more. And that's sort of what I've been excited about exploring less than facets, less than overall shape at this point is like, how little needs to be there and how good does that feel when you have just the right amount and no more and knowing what the limits are and it's going to be different for different pieces of wood and different forms depending on how they're used depending on the qualities of that particular piece of wood so it's it's not it's not a formula where it one size fits all it's more of a sense that you build up over time just how much you can remove. Yeah, now those back shoulders are the right thickness. Good. So now I can take this thickness here and blend it forward. Um, now again, I'm going to try to keep building longer cuts. And the trick with a longer cut, when you're trying to make a cut that goes like this, is to not let it nosedive. Um, so one of the things you'll see is I'm not holding the knife with the uh, front leading edge of the handle right in this point. It's tipped up slightly. And what that means is that the default setting as I go forward is that the blade is still wants to ride up. And that's my insurance policy that I'm not gonna dive too deep into the wood. I actually never articulated that even to myself before. But that knife is tipped up and then I will lean it down in, but the natural motion of my hand to go neutral pops the edge up and out and that keeps me from diving too deeply in the wood as I'm making these cuts, getting closer and closer to a really delicate wall thickness. It's actually a really good tip. This is what I love about teaching, is I realize things about what I'm doing that I've never articulated before. It happens every single time. I don't know how it keeps happening. It just does. Okay, notice how I've changed direction, because I was getting a little bit of grain tear out on the edges of those cuts, so I've got to turn around and blend it in, going from the other direction. Okay, really? No one thinks that that tip was amazing? I think that was like the coolest thing I've articulated in a long time. I feel like that will help a lot of people. And I've never heard anyone articulate it before. Heck, I don't even know if other people do it.
right. Now, getting my way close now. As I do this rim, I want to sort of get the rim to an even consistency as I go along. Oh, <laughs> Tom, I realized that when I'm doing these cuts on the back of the bowl, where I'm getting real close to the final thickness that I want it to be, and it would be, it would be real easy to dive the knife down in too deep. I realize that I am not holding the knife with the edge right at my fingertip. I'm not holding it like that, like how I hold it all the rest of the time. I've actually twisted the knife slightly so that it is not. You see how it's it's. Yeah, it's like I'm holding it like this. It's twisted slightly, which has the effect of the blade when my hand is in a neutral position, the blade is is up. You see how that edge is up? And so when I want to engage the blade to go down, it has to be a deliberate choice. And I'm not in danger of over uh of pushing the knife too deep into the blade and plowing right through that real thin wall. I've instead, because the blade is twisted, the, the the sort of default position is going to be coming out of the cut and that's preserving my wall thickness. And that allows me to sort of get closer and closer to a nice wall thickness without um, without blowing through it by accident. Does that make sense, Matt? So it's about it's about twisting, yeah, it's about twisting the, the knife in your hand so that it's it the edge wants to come back up when you're because I think most of us our hand sort of wants to be in a neutral position. If I want to engage, my hand has to be cocked in this slightly uncomfortable position. Um, whereas if I had the blade the way I normally hold it, I would be much more likely to just right into the right into the spoon bowl and go too deep. Okay, so now you can see how I'm trying to build these facets one to the other. And what happens is sort of, you'll do little facet, little facet, it'll feel choppy, and then all of a sudden, psh, it'll just start gliding through a, a bunch of facets at once. And the texture will change from being like choppy facets to being much more like, um, like if you look down at like the, I don't know, the Nile River Delta, right? It's just like a sort of tangle of stuff um, uh, that Sherry tell me more what you what your what your question is so it becomes much more a texture of sort of like a braid of rivers flowing together than sort of chop 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 how's your finger in it? yeah no it's it's in part because it's it's I'm cutting so much end grain here um, and again, the power is all coming from pulling these fingers back like this. Um, and then it's being transferred to the blade from this thumb. And notice how often I'm feeling the thickness now. Delicacy is where I want it. Now I just need to get this last little quadrant and then do the chamfers on the other side and I'll be done. All right, here's that moment where you need to know yourself and know when to stop. There's always something more that you could do. The question is, when does it make sense to not try to do it? Um, and for me, I'm at that point. I think, you know, you kind of, I mean, probably you need to like blitz past that point and do way too much on a couple spoons before you start recognizing what it feels like when you're there. Um, 
but it's not something I can consciously articulate. It's more like I go around, I go around, everything's kind of within tolerable limits. And I think, okay, it's pretty good. All right, good, good, good. Make that a little bit smoother. There's this one spot here that's Okay, so that's finishing cuts. Um, my newly articulated tip limits the reach of the blade to not dive in. It, it's, it doesn't limit the reach of the blade, Sherry. What it does is it limits the tendency of the blade to dive in by making the, by changing the blade angle so that it's tilted slightly up within my hand, right? So you can see um, how to show this. You can see that instead of this handle being tilted right into the crotch of there, it's tilted slightly this way. That means that in order to engage the blade, I need to make a deliberate choice to go down like this because my hand really wants to be neutral, but neutral pops the blade up. Does that make sense? Um, and so each time I, I push it down to follow the curvature of the bowl, it's a deliberate choice. And, and if I start to coast, it's going to naturally come up out of it, and that's going to keep me from nose diving into the grain and plowing right through that wall. So now I'm going to do a little micro chamfer on the outside edge. Good. Again, it's essentially letting the weight of the blade. Excuse me. Do the work because of the because you're on the back of the bowl. You don't have to worry about. Um, the trickiness of going against the grain, you just go from the widest part to the to the narrow part, from the sides of the bowls to the tip and the handle on either side, and that should do it. Good, at this point the trick is to not blow it. Hold on, what did Tom say? Interesting, yeah. All right, um, so good, 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 good. I've done everything. It's always good to just sort of check that you've done everything that you planned on doing um, because here I'm just adjusting. When you look at it from the side, I want even curvature or from the end rather. Um, I've had times when I realized like I completely forgot to do the tip of the handle or anything like that. All right, now one last thing. Adjust that. Make that a little more delicate. Yeah, that's much better. Don't be afraid to make a few changes here at the end. Just because you're going to have to redo those micro chamfers doesn't mean it's not worth making a few small changes to the apparent thickness of the rim because honestly the thing that you notice the most when you're using something is the the delicacy of this rim um, I don't know Tom I think I, I think I'm not sure I have a favorite I have things that I like to carve less than the other things um, and guys, I have 25 seconds remaining. I would say it's always fun to do small forms. Um, it's always fun to do uh, sort of larger, more generous forms. I'd say I, I like doing the giant forms the least um, just because they are a lot of material to remove. So like the ostrich ladle and the flower scoop, um, I probably suffer the most doing those.